Welcome everyone to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and this, our 16th anniversary celebrations. Now, obviously, this is going to be a webinar. But if you've engaged with us on our many public outreach programs, you'll also know that the school has constantly tried to be innovative and creative in the ways in which we engage with the local and international communities. Over the years, our anniversary celebrations have taken many different forms. Just last year, we mounted a huge festival of ideas, putting on over 90 hours of programming and content, engaging hundreds of speakers, welcoming thousands of footfalls through our beautiful Bukit Timah campus. Because this year has, of course, been a little bit different but we have gained valuable lessons from our many innovative programs, including our successful Global is Asian Asia Thinker series that beginning small has grown to engage regularly hundreds, if not thousands of online attendees. 2020, our 16th anniversary is very unfortunately also the year of the global coronavirus pandemic. All of us, all of humanity, has had to struggle in these very challenging times, from difficult economic circumstances to relinquishing, giving up small joys from daily life, enjoying a quiet laugh with friends, small intimate dinners, laughing with our colleagues. A lot of this has been put on hold. We've all had difficult times to deal with, but of course, all of humanity did not sign up for a global economy that turned around from 3% growth to minus 5%, to having to deal with the United States, the leading, the leading economy, suffering an unemployment rate that went from the lowest it had been in 50 years to the highest it was going to be for 90 years, all in the space of 60 terrible days in March and April. No one signed up for a world where 59 million people were going to be infected and 1.4 million people die before their time. These are difficult circumstances. But of course, here at the Bukit Timah campus and at the Lee Kuan Yew School, we have continued to, try to deliver what on our mission. Okay. We have a mission of t pushing on to ever higher academic and intellectual leadership. And all this time, our leading priority has been the health and safety of our community. As we've done that, we've continued to push on thought leadership, on in lessons in improving standards of governance, and helping transform the world for a better more sustainable global environment. COVID-19 is a bad enough situation to hit humanity at any time. But as luck would have it, it's come at a time of other great disruptions in the world, a harrowing geostrategic US-China rivalry. Okay. Class confrontation in all societies around the world as the weak and vulnerable felt that they have stood by the sidelines while others raised ahead of them. They've looked at a cosmopolitan elite that seemed to play according to their own rules. Even as all of this was going on, huge chunks of humanity were growing a disdain for science and expertise. We'll all remember that before COVID-19 hit, actually the World Health Organization had acknowledged that the anti-vax movement, vaccine hesitancy, where many families were refusing to have their children vaccinated, had come to be one of the World Health Organization's top 10 global public health threats of 2019. And of course, in the midst of all this, a huge challenge in sustainability and preserving our natural environment. This has been a problem for all of the world and not least for us here in Singapore. And it is this last 
that forms the subject of our webinar today on the challenges and opportunities for Asia in our common journey forwards on sustainability and the environment. I want to thank you all for tuning in this afternoon. Please enjoy the conversation and participate actively in our session on Facebook live chat and in posing questions to our panel. I hope you find the session helpful, informative, and provocative. Thank you all very much once again for tuning in. Thank you very much, Dean Danny Kwa, for those important and purposeful um, opening words to begin our session today. Um, I want to begin and just take a few moments to uh, talk about um, the way in which the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy um, thinks about providing knowledge but also policy tools for addressing our contemporary policy challenges. And nowhere are these challenges um, more acute and more important uh, than when it comes to the global environment and sustainability challenges that all countries and regions uh, face. From the climate crisis, which threatens both ecological systems and economic systems, to the biodiversity crisis where uh, a million species are being threatened with extinction, to the plight of vulnerable peoples who are affected by climate change, and to the way in which our water systems are being required to adapt and also um, us to modify our behavior, all create complex challenges that the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy both helps us to understand how do these issues get on the policy agenda, how do society and policymakers think about addressing them in important and meaningful ways, but also we at the Lee Kuan Yew School also think about policy analysis and policy tools. What are the things we can do? What are the tools available to us, whether it be governments, businesses, NGOs, and our own individual behaviors to address these complex challenges? So today, you're going to hear a lot about the term fit for purpose policy analysis. And in this webinar, we want to do a few things to highlight the important role that the Lee Kuan Yew um, School plays in thinking about fit for purpose policy tools to address environmental uh, challenges. The first thing we're going to do is we've got a wonderful panel of faculty at the Lee Kuan Yew School that will highlight some of the work they're doing, both on policy and the environment and sustainability, and also the possibilities for the future. Um, and after we have uh, um, the faculty, including myself, say a few words, we're then going to open up the conversation to you, the audience, as well, to engage in a collaborative conversation about what, what are the most important issues that you think are critical for Singapore, ASEAN, and the world, and what are the thoughts that the faculty have in that regard. So I'm going to just say a few things before I begin and introduce my, the first of my three colleagues, um, and that is to introduce myself a little bit to you. And so my name is Ben Kashor, and I'm the Li Keqing um, Professor in Public Management. Um, and I'm also co-director of the Institute um, of Water Policy. And I'm excited to say that the Lee Kuan Yew School is taking its rich heritage on water policy and also now incorporating broader challenges, including the environment, biodiversity, and of course, the climate crisis, as part of our vision to think about how do we coalesce knowledge around policy studies to help society and government address these, 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 these important issues. Um, and so my own work, we think about um, the different kinds of policy challenges that face governments, from the important questions of water use um, to the climate crisis to the biodiversity crisis. And so what I want to do is just highlight one or two words for you that are really important for the work that I do with my colleagues, both here and across the world, and those words are super wicked. Okay. Super wicked problems come to us in very important ways because they are add additional components to thinking about the environment and sustainability. So what are super wicked problems that require special attention? We find um, that 
Three fe four features really matter when thinking about these policy challenges. The first is that time is running out. So some environmental questions are more important than others because if you don't act, it's too late. And we know with the climate crisis that um, carbon emissions stay in the atmosphere for 300 years and we risk a tipping point in um, the coming uh, 10 years or so where it's too late to act. Time is running out. The second one is that there's no central authority. There's no one place to go in the world to address all these problems. So how we think about bottom-up solutions, collaborative governance becomes really important for these questions. The third is that those who are causing the problems also want to try and solve them. So all the problems we have are battles with ourselves. How do we change our own behavior as we both emit carbon, uh, affect the environment, but also want to improve the environment itself. And then finally, the fourth feature is that we um, uh, often tend to um, develop policies that discount the future in what we call irrational ways. As the future emerges, we end up pushing off responsibilities into the future in ways that are inconsistent with the scientific knowledge about our, about our crises that we're facing. So we're going to now begin and talk a bit about our own scientific knowledge at the Lee Kuan Yew School and what our faculty are working on uh, in ways that are important to the environment for Singapore, for ASEAN as a whole, and for, of course, the global community in which we all live and participate. So I'm going to turn now to Professor Liang Ching, who is um, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, professor here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and also the Dean for the Office of Student Affairs at, uh, at the National University of Singapore to say a few opening comments to begin our conversation. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ben. And thank you to everybody who is joining us uh, out there uh, on, on uh, Facebook Live. Um, I thought I'll say a little bit about urbanization, cities, and the environment. That informs quite a lot of the work we do at the Lee Kuan Yew School. So the first thing I thought um, to speak about was density. So you would think, um, Cities tend to be really dense, and that's kind of thought to be one of the negative features. Uh, but for an environmentalist, not really. So density has a special magic of efficiency. So if you're closer together, it allows you to do many different things quite differently than you would if you were living quite far apart. So one of the things um, that my colleagues have done is to look at rainwater harvesting. So if you look at rainwater from the top of a building um, and sort of investigate whether that provides enough for the entire water requirements of the people living in the building, um, what would that look like? Um, how much would that cost? Who would finance it? What kind of infrastructure would you need? So density and the environmental impact of this density um, can go one of two ways, right? So one of the things we're studying is how, to, how does density allow us to be greener, so, green uh, so rainwater harvesting uh, being one, but also something interesting like recycling, recycling behaviors. So one of my uh, colleagues uh, at the Institute of Water Policy, she also studies recycling in terms of uh, so the identity of a person when you recycle by uh, giving it to uh, a recycling firm uh, you then treat the, the thing itself, the material, as a commodity. But if you recycle by gifting it or giving it to charity, it transforms uh, the material from a commodity into a gift. So these sorts of research um, speaks to the identity of a person and the act itself. So uh, the variety of um, things that we can study uh, really uh, is enormous. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the use of price. Um, living in a city, we tend to value environmental capital in different ways, but the most common way is price. So how do you price water? How do you price clean air? And maybe in an urban environment, it becomes paradoxically it's sort of an artificial environment, but allows us to price what we would ordinarily consider as natural endowments quite instinctively. So in Singapore, of course, we price our water to price recovery. And quite a lot of other countries, too, surprisingly, um, have this idea 
So that, that we've done studies which show that people feel sometimes that the price of water is too low. And why do they say that? They see it as a sort of a companion to sometimes the water service being not quite as good as it should be. So price is often tied to service. And maybe that's peculiarly uh, salient in an urban environment. The third thing I wanted to say that we study is behavior. Uh, again, this ties back to my first point on density. But the impact of human behavior in a city is enormous. So we, we do lots of fun stuff. We run experiments. So one of the latest experiments that I did myself is to see uh, this peculiar thing that human beings compensate for our virtuous behavior. So if we save water in one area, do we then think we can be more wasteful about water in another? Um, meaning, is there a negative spillover effect to water saving behaviors in one instance? So um, unfortunately, the answer seems to be yes. But this is one of many um, interesting things that we can do uh, in an urban setting. And I hope uh, to bring this forward in our discussion. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Ching, for those really important uh, uh, ideas about how uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School, we, we apply scientific uh, research into practical questions that matter to uh, uh, thinking about solving Singapore's challenges in the global, in the global context. In that regard now, we're going to turn to our next speaker, uh, Professor Vino Thomas, who um, spent many years as Vice President of the World Bank, um, as a way to show you how the Lee Kuan Yew School both, again, thinks about important scholarship, but also translating that into, into practical and important insights for society and non-governmental organizations. So I will turn the floor over to Professor Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, great to join all of you. Um, uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, start with the observation that, you know, we are, as um, <clears throat> Danny mentioned, in the midst of multiple crises and the environmental and cri climate crisis uh, increasingly dominates all else. They are not separate issues, but they affect all other issues that we deal with. And clearly, uh, Lee Kuan Yew School's program uh, is making this a central part, one that permeates all other programs as well uh, in understanding and in the final analysis to be more useful in terms of the application of policies. So in the limited uh, time in this opening uh, comments, complementing what uh, this wonderful panel uh, has, has and will be saying, uh, let me just pick up on five uh, quick observations uh, that are part of the coursework, research, and analysis at uh, LKY. Um, the first is really uh, something that Professor uh, uh, Kashore has uh, signaled in terms of the super wicked problem, and uh, he calls the fit for purpose tools that are needed to address them, is the great divide, probably the greatest we've ever seen between scientific knowledge and policy applications. Uh, on the one side, every projection, uh, every indication is that the climate crisis and the environmental crisis and the biodiversity crisis are bigger than ever and bigger than what we had anticipated. At the same time, policy action lags. There, there is progress. There are things that are being done that we had not imagined before, but that wedge between the scientific knowledge and what needs to be done is growing, not declining, including in our region of Southeast Asia. Uh, and so that uh, becomes a central key uh, area uh, for investigation for all of us. Related to that, why that wedge is so uh, 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 overwhelming? Uh, and the answer, of course, has many aspects, but Picking up on the economic link, uh, I would make the second point that while people had imagined that addressing the environment, biodiversity, and climate are things for the future, for distant lands, and one that conflicts with economic growth, uh, 
and therefore should be put off to the future, the reality is striking us that the relationship is quite the opposite, which is to say, unless these are taken on with a sense of urgency and urgency that we still don't see in the policy circles, uh, the economic growth phenomenon will not take place. So to address human progress in other respects, the priority for environmental and climate action is huge and bigger than ever. And then um, third, um, what is being done? I think um, Professor Kennedy might be referring to some of these things. Uh, on the big picture, you have seen the announcements from China uh, and then Japan, Korea uh, on major initiatives that would lead to a zero carbon economy down the road, uh, 2050, 2060. Uh, and then the United States new administration, uh, its economic plan already signals a similar target for achieving zero carbon uh, emissions. Uh, this is good, but I want to note that Southeast Asia, uh, the projections are going the wrong way in the sense that fossil fuel use uh, net of all else is in fact increasing and not decreasing. And this needs to be reversed. And for the ones who have announced uh, targets for 2050 or 60, the key point is that the benefits to taking early action far outweigh the benefits to taking late action. So it's in a way comforting to just say that uh, by 2050, things will have changed, but the problem and the urgency is now. And so if it is Singapore on the 100 billion um, plan, um, it is critical that that expenditure be front loaded, early actions rather than late actions if we want to see the benefits in time. Um, and then the fourth point I was going to make is that in all of this and including the 100 billion plan for, for Singapore, the focus has been a lot on adaptation, which is critical. That is sea level defenses, better drainage systems and so on. However, at the same time, unless mitigation, that is preventing uh, the accumulation of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions were not emphasized, it would be like uh, we keeping on cleaning up the floor, mopping up the floor while the tap continues to rise it is not going to be a viable alternative. So how do we do adaptation? How do we do mitigation? And what is the balance? And tools like cost benefit analysis uh, and behavioral analysis on how people change mindsets and behavior, those become critical tools for us to apply. And those are also part of the uh, work at uh, LKY. Finally, um, I think on the uh, relationship with, with all, all of the other policies, uh, some of the points that uh, uh, Professor Leong had mentioned uh, come to mind. And for instance, on the urban front, uh, climate action, uh, critical as it is, has a complementary leg in local pollution uh, control like black carbon reduction that both addresses respiratory and uh, uh, illnesses, particularly in some of the big cities in Southeast Asia, um, while at the same time making a dent on the climate. And so seeking these complementary solutions will be a big part of the agenda, but still keeping in mind that that's not going to be automatic. And some of the approaches that Professor Kashor has been talking about, which go beyond uh, simple economic solutions, including the political economy, uh, become critical in our work. Uh, the agenda is huge. I couldn't be more urgent. Uh, and LKY's work program is making a sincere attempt to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Thomas. And I just want to uh, I don't know, reinforce and highlight how his research is showing that when it comes to uh, future impacts, economic growth and the environment are not necessarily at odds with each other, but the problem is that right now we're seeing it that way. And so the tools that he just talked about actually help society and policymakers to think about better addressing those long-term 
challenges, which of course is the fourth key feature of super wicked problems. So he's helping to overcome these kinds of challenges. And now we're going to turn to um, Professor Marina Canetti, who is a specialist of global governance, but also of China's role in geopolitics, to talk about her work on the implications of her research for uh, environmental challenges in ASEAN and, and globally. So over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, my initial remarks, I want to focus on two things, uh, building on, on some of the things that were expressed already. And the first thing is interdisciplinarity, which is what we do here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And the second is the practical experiential learning that we engage our students in. So it's not just our research, it's also how we teach and how we engage with students. So let me turn to interdisciplinarity first to speak about uh, the super wicked problems and geopolitics and the environment and how all of these things mesh together. Uh, something that Professor Vinod just mentioned was the announcement by China in 2060 that they are going to go carbon neutral. Um, massive announcement that took the news by storm. Nobody was expecting this. It almost became a bigger news than uh, the COVID pandemic for a day. Um, and then because of that, uh, China, uh, sorry, Japan and South Korea also went with their announcement. So this speaks both to the idea of global authority, right? They were responding to their Paris um, agreements that they had signed and also um, the urge, the global urge to, to create perhaps a space where everybody can um, show their commitment to uh, carbon neutrality. Yeah. Now, the interesting part for me is the geopolitical implications of China saying, we are going to not be dependent on oil and gas anymore. Because currently, China's dependency on oil and gas um, is directly linked to their foreign policy. How? Where do they source their oil and gas? From Iraq, from Saudi Arabia, and um, Russia. Right? So in terms of geostrategic positioning, um, China is very interested right now to securitize the sea lanes um, across the uh, Indian Ocean, South China Sea, and the Malacca Straits. Um, and China saying, we are going to wean ourselves from the dependency on oil um, that comes from abroad is a very huge announcement. Um, and that will have implications for everyone in the region. So now everybody is very focused on what's happening in the Indian Ocean, Malacca Strait, South China Sea. Um, and of course, they should be. But 20 years from now, this is not where the Chinese will be putting their eggs. Right? They're developing an entirely different basket of how they're going to uh, get themselves to be uh, carbon neutral. Now, let me move to uh, the other aspect, which is the aspect of practical experiential learning in the little time that I have left. As I said, um, a lot of our work is not just what we can do ourselves and also what kind of policy advice we can develop for governments, but also how we get our students involved in our work. Um, so two ways, of course, they can be our wonderful research assistants. And also even more importantly, we push them to develop their capstones uh, around issues of environment, environmental sustainability. Currently, there are already students who are working on electric vehicles, uh, working on recycling, working on issues of biodiversity, working on agricultural um, production in Singapore. And so these are the ways in which we also tap into um, what the school can offer uh, to students and through the work that the faculty is, uh, is doing. So I'll stop here for now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marina Canetti, for that nice overview. And also um, by making a really important point that uh, 
We also engage students and we train the next generation of leaders on these important questions by linking our research uh, to teaching. And uh, we also engage external stakeholders to foster dialogues, to foster a serious conversation around these really important questions facing Singapore, ASEAN, um, and the world. So with that, I first want to turn to Professor Liang Ching and ask you, I mean, you've done a lot of work on experiments, a lot of work thinking about how humans behave and the implications for policy making generally. So my question to you is, given this is a challenge when it comes to the climate crisis or water use or biodiversity that affects all of us at different levels as individuals and as governments uh, and so on, what are some of the things that citizens can do that you learned from your research that could actually help improve uh, sustainability in some fashion? What are, what are some things that citizens can do? And then related, what are the lessons uh, from the Singapore case for other cities around the world as well? So, so I think it's, well, the good news and the bad news. Right? So we ran a recent experiment. Um, so the good news, right? Um, how do people, how are people motivated by money? And how are people mo uh, motivated by non-price signals? So for example, do people behave in a certain way because you tell them you can save money or make money? That's one way. Or how do people behave if you tell them it's the right thing to do? Right. It's good for the environment. It'll leave the earth a better place. So we did a really neat experiment uh, on water saving. So would you save water if you were incentivized by a certain amount of money? Or would you save water if you knew your neighbor was saving water? Or would you save water if you knew you were doing the right thing? It turns out, and this was surprising to us because this was done in Singapore, um, that people are not really motivated by money. So if you paid them to save water, they won't save any more than if you told them it was a good thing to do. So um, we, we tested three different kinds of treatment and economic like price mechanism, uh, an information mechanism, meaning you know what your neighbor uses, and the campaign mechanism, which is to tell them that it's a generally good thing. So that's the good news, right? That, that if you're a policymaker or if you're a citizen and you respond to these sorts of messages, um, generally people are motivated by the act of saving the earth itself. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news um, is the sort of problem that environmental problems are, as you say, super wicked. It's almost a perfect storm for biases that degrade the environment. So for example, we choose convenience over you know, things such as truly recycling uh, or you know, even using a cup to drink water rather than the mineral water bottle. That took the school, the Lee Kuan Yew School, took a long time, seven years, to move from mineral bottles to these sorts of things, which you had to wash, which are much heavier, which can break and you know, logistically so much clumsier. So the human instinct is to search for convenience, that's one, and of course to discount the long term, right. which is the other. And most importantly, I think uh, for a public policy school, uh, it provides very little incentive for bureaucrats to work on because it's so hard to claim credit for solving any particular environment. As you say, there's nobody in charge. Right. Like, I'm going to clean the air above Singapore now, and that's not going to work, right? right. So um, that's, that's why, I mean, that's bad news, and that's why it remains quite a wicked problem. Right. But as you rightly pointed out, and Marina rightly said, um, leadership uh, does make quite a big difference. The, the demonstration effect also works. So yeah, I, I think my one take home from what you just said is that the uplifting point is that actually values do matter. Indeed. Right? Our norms matter in some way, right? Mm. And so one question is how do we then switch from these sort of contradictory approaches, behaviors we have? On the one hand, our norms do matter. On the other hand, you say things take a long time to change. How do we do that? And I want to turn over to, to Professor um, Vino Thomas and ask you, you know, you've talked about uh, how the economy and the environment in the long term are actually on the same side in these questions. Um, but as you point that out, in the short term, it isn't always clear uh, that that's the case. We kind of revert back to our short term interests. So how do you as a scholar focused on practical questions get students, society, policymakers to think about these long term implications? when we live in such a short-term oriented uh, world? What do you do to try and shift the long-term conversation? 
Oh, we're not sure we have um, a voice yet. Uh, do we have voice? Um, yeah. Oh, now uh, we do. The, the, the short term, long term conflict uh, probably, like you said, uh, defines the nature of the problem more sharply than many other approaches. Um, uh, election cycles are necessarily short term and um, uh, the focus becomes heavily on what would deliver short term growth. Uh, and we rank countries on the basis of short term performance, uh, indicators of competitiveness, widely used ones, whether it's from the World Bank or World Economic Forum, uh, give high marks to countries who can push or generate short term growth, uh, even as its implication for even beyond five years could be quite uh, negative. Uh, and so having been ranked high, investment flows also favor those countries. These are really perverse effects uh, for which uh, those indicators, which are partial, but dangerously partial, it's okay to be partial, but not when the policy implications really are wrong, uh, could lead you to the wrong conclusion that slashing environmental regulations, uh, acting slow on climate, things that take resources away uh, from what looks like those that generate very quick uh, uh, single bottom line uh, returns uh, are better uh, than investing on something more sustainable. So uh, the whole approach here is coined uh, sustainability uh, for a very good reason, that we need to change the matrix uh, and uh, we really have to measure things uh, differently and measure different things. Uh, it's easier said than done because uh, even for data reasons, it's easier to just look at GDP growth in the short term and rank countries and so on. So I, I just strongly endorse your point as a, as a game changer uh, that changing our uh, matrix of analysis and uh, focusing a bit on uh, the time frame could do wonders. That, of course, is not the whole story. Uh, there is a lot one can talk about uh, uh, in terms of what actions uh, would generate um, long-term growth uh, without uh, sacrificing the short-term rightly defined in terms of the welfare of the people. Human health is really one example. And I mentioned uh, uh, the air pollution, um, say in the ca case of Delhi, uh, it's uh, at the moment, uh, post Diwali, it's absolutely unbearable. And um, is that short term or long term? It is both. And so taking action on those will deliver. But people's, like Professor Ching was mentioning, uh, people's um, um, preferences, <coughs> households, businesses, as well as the government, and changing of the mindsets uh, to value those, but also act on that valuation in real time uh, would at least l reduce this conflict that we observe between short and the, and the long. In a nutshell, if we thought that not acting on environment and climate were good for short-term growth, the truth is exactly the opposite. Not acting on them is really bad for economic growth and progress. Thank you very much, and that really speaks, I think, to the other important role the Lee Kuan Yew School plays, which is to just generate knowledge about these issues in ways that can be so complex in so many ways uh, that we, can, uh, we, are, we can, are able to distill and identify the, the critical challenges, including, for example, Professor Thomas's point about pollution in India uh, as relating to these broader challenges as well, and how do they get on the policy agenda? vis-a-vis uh, -vis other issues is a, is a key, is a key um, issue that we focus on in this school. And I want to, um, in that context, um, ask my colleague, Professor Marina Canetti, you mentioned about these commitments that China and other countries have made recently uh, on climate change, and it sounds very promising. We are, of course, now on the positive side of the story. It's very exciting, and this is a very meaningful set of things to say. Uh, you work on China, on global governance. I happen to be um, able to participate in a class you had on a simulation on global climate negotiations with your students right. last year that was uh, really impactful and important and the students weighed these issues about country level interests with global interests. Um, so my question for you is, as you know, the countries have been committing 
for a long time to reducing their climate emissions. And one of the stories of the last 30 years is commitments that haven't kept up as times marched on, right. which is elements one and four of, the, of super wicked problems. Mm -hmm. So given that countries mean it when they say this, but given the historical evidence that sometimes they fall short, how do you think about that in terms of these geopolitics? And what are the incentives for China to keep its commitments as time goes on in the global context of globalization and economic growth? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting and very complex question. Um, I, I think there's many different ways to address that question. Uh, first of all, what has been particularly interesting is the rise of China as a climate leader, something that 10 years ago nobody would even think about, uh, that China would be the climate leader. So China created a very interesting niche for itself um, in the space for uh, climate leadership and, and for um, sort of advancing an alternative agenda on climate uh, action, which was not did not necessarily start from the point of we are committing to cutting our carbon emissions. It took quite some time to actually get the the Chinese government to commit to, to any cuts or to any reduction, right? But what they did was actually develop uh, this alternative energy uh, field uh, very massively. So to the extent that alternative energy sources are now a viable alternative, that, ha that is very much uh, the credit, m maybe not 100%, but to a large extent, that's a credit to the Chinese because they utilize that space to develop. Now, whether or not um, cutting carbon emissions is really what will get us to achieve our goals uh, in terms of climate, uh, preventing climate change, that's a completely different story. Right? Uh, and that is because um, Climate change is not just carbon emissions. Right. There are so many other aspects of climate change that are not taken into account. And here is where I want to bring a very peculiar example again from China. Actually, I'll, uh, if, if I have the time, I sure. want to bring two examples. One is from China, something that's not discussed very much. Uh, it started happening this year. Is China put a 10-year ban on fishing on the Yangtze River. And that is, I cannot explain to you how significant this is for a country that's going through a pandemic, for a country that says that uh, poverty reduction is a top priority. Right. And then, instead of pushing for economic development, they say, very sorry, we have to preserve the river. Right? So that, that is quite unique. It's, I think, uh, an entirely new development for China and something that hopefully we'll see coming in, in other areas as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's really important, uh, again, not too much attention is paid to, to such examples, is let's say when China goes to national parks around Africa or Indonesia and develops coal mining, Right. Right, which happened most recently in Zimbabwe. Right. So massive protests in Zimbabwe, uh, the coal mining contract was cut off, no more coal mining, right? So there is a space where um, civil society, uh, popular discontent have a role to play, right? So we are talking about climate change, global governance, central authority, but civil society plays a very big role in pushing certain agendas and actually acting on behalf of what needs to happen on the ground. Not always, but there are examples. And what I think is really interesting about your examples is that you know, we do a lot of work in this school, on, on including myself, on market mechanisms, finance tools, behavioral incentives, but your examples show us that also public policy and regulations also do important things too. Uh, and we, we need to think about, in, in the school we do, what are the appropriate policy mixes available to governments that might address the problem at hand? And in your case in this river, it appeared that a ban was probably the, 
the scientific solution, right? So that's really important, looking science, solutions, and policies uh, uh, together. I'm going to turn over to the audience now. We've got some really interesting questions, but I just wanted to give a shout out to my, um, my colleague, M. Ramesh, uh, to just illustrate how there's a broader set of faculty at LKY School that also contributes to these questions. And he edits a journal um, called Policy Design and Practice. And at LKY School, the focus is on policy design. How do we think about uh, developing sophisticated policy tools around the problems that are vexing governments? And that does require significant efforts into the scholarship and practice of designing themselves. Uh, and there's a lot we are doing here in that quest for these fit-for-purpose fit for policy tools governing the environment, governing climate change, governing water, water use. So the first question I'm going to uh, turn to, and this again, I'm going to pose this of all three um, of my colleagues here, um, is by Christine Pang, and she asked the question, um, and I'll, I'll probably start with um, Pro Professor Liang Ching, given the question. She asked the question, do smaller states have the same role to play as compared to larger states when it comes to environmental and climate crises? Uh, uh, it's a really important question, um, and given the global context. And then she asks, what can smaller states credibly do, especially those in ASEAN? So first to Professor Lian Ching, how, how would you answer that question? Yeah, so it's, it's really neat. I mean, this um, porosity between categories, right? Big states and small states. So Vinu earlier pointed out that um, in environmental problems, uh, the binary thought of long-term versus short-term question uh, are collapsing. Uh, the binary between economic goals and environmental goals, it's collapsing. Uh, so to, to Christine's question, um, the role of a small state and the role of big state, of course, um, for a long time, we used to, uh, the people, small states like Singapore used to get away by saying that, well, we are so small, we don't really matter uh, in the environment, but not really. I, I think the size matters in some things, but also uh, big states and small states in environmental uh, impact is collapsing. I'll give you an example. Uh, Singapore uh, can be useful as uh, um, sort of an experiment on how urbanization can coexist with environmental goals. Uh, uh, I've already mentioned some uh, behavioral uh, um, changes that we have that impact the world. Um, our goal to grow 30% of our food, for example, uh, in a country where, which wastes maybe 450 grams of food a day, everybody, each one of us, um, uh, and imports 90% of our food. But to switch from that to a 30% of food production by 2030, that's in 10 years, I think that allows us to have uh, you know, a lot of policy implications for other cities uh, who can look at us and look at our experiments and, say, and see whether that fits I into what they do. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first thing that I can see is the policy relevance and, and replication of, of our experiments. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense, especially in the context of Singapore as both a city-state where the, the, the lessons about urbanization and its engagement with broader environmental challenges is really important because a lot of the times the problems that Singapore is facing as a concerned country are outside of its borders. Uh, in the ASEAN context of deforestation, for example, and species extinctions, they're happening elsewhere as well, but they're, we're, they're, they're part of that community. So, um, Professor Marina Kennedy, I'm wondering what you think about that challenge. On the one hand, you've got these small states. On the other hand, they're part of broader biodiversity loss. We're all part of this consumption and production system. So where do small states fit in, given your work on global governance yeah. and the environment? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question, and I, I wish Christine was in, in my class where we have the climate simulation. Right. So she could experience herself um, the challenge of being a small state having to compete against uh, bigger states and bigger players. So th that is usually uh, how um, people think of this, that small states actually don't have the capacity to, to engage. But I very much follow what uh, Ching is saying here, which is that small states have a particular niche role to play in the type of 
policies that they can introduce the type of technological innovations that they can disseminate to others. Some, these are things that Singapore is doing very proactively. So definitely um, there are spaces where small states matter a lot in the type of leadership that they can take in, in this crisis yeah, that we are you. living in. Yeah. yeah, and that I think nicely segues to Professor Vino Thomas who recently wrote an opinion piece about the important role that India and China will have to play uh, in geopolitics and the climate crisis. Um, but this question is really the, kind of the near opposite of that argument, that hey, don't small states also have a role to play in geopolitics and the, and the climate challenges? So how do you, how do you answer Christine's <coughs> question about the small state role? Yes, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I think when you look at the aggregate numbers, uh, the total, uh, the US, China, and India combined would be between 50 and uh, two thirds of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so if they do not take action, all bets are off. So the burden clearly uh, is on the size uh, as far as that goes. Now, if you go to per capita, I mean, in a way, that is the mark of uh, responsibility. Uh, all need to act proportionately. And then the case of Singapore clearly uh, rises to the top. Um, Singapore's footprint is small, uh, again, in absolute terms, uh, but its potential role uh, is huge. Um, that is because, can you imagine Singapore not taking climate mitigation? Uh, adaptation, yes, meaning sea level uh, walls and drainage systems and so on, but not uh, mitigation, for example, 95% uh, reliance on natural gases, uh, less polluting than uh, carbon, uh, than coal, but still uh, is a fossil fuel. Um, but Southeast Asia needs to act heavily. So Singapore could set the uh, modeling behavior. Uh, it helps its own economy if it's uh, in, the, in the coming years. Um, and there are um, local benefits as well. So in light of that, the role of Singapore, despite its small size, uh, within a regional context, if not a global context, Singapore being uh, the highest per capita economy in uh, Asia, um, it is extraordinary. And so that divide or the dif distinction between small and big states in terms of uh, even mitigation uh, disappears. Uh, when we look at it on what needs to be done. I, I will, in the interest of time, not talk about the huge importance of other environmental biodiversity and other interests where that distinction uh, totally evaporates because think of Costa Rica, small economy, uh, it is doing a lot on those areas, uh, not for the global benefit alone, but because it does help a sustainable economy in Costa Rica. Thank you. Yeah, a really interesting point about then the, the conversation around responsibilities. Large countries geopolitically have that because of the nature of the geopolitical system. But as Professor Thomas pointed out, when you look at per capita uh, climate emission related pollutants, it's a different story. Um, and in fact, I often talk about how Canadians and Australians may think that they're not as responsible as, for example, the United States. But when you look at the per capita emissions, they're on par. Right? And so responsibilities matter. And we play a role in our school in generating knowledge around different ways of seeing um, responsibility, which of course is um, the third feature of super wicked problems. <laughs> so I'm now going to turn to uh, a second, a really important question from uh, Yi Yang Wang. And he writes, and he asks the question, on fit for purpose policy analysis, may I ask the panel to address two questions? Firstly, what is the purpose? Okay, very, very important question. And, and then uh, he asks uh, underneath that, more mitigation and less adaptation? So what's the purpose? Uh, is it electricity grid upgrade rather than recycling initiatives? So what is the actual thing you want to actually do? And then secondly, how to assess uh, fitness? Is it cost effectiveness or just effectiveness? Okay, um, and how can then the urgency, which of course is feature number one of 
super wicked problems? How can urgency also be factored in? So a really important uh, two-part question. And I'll, maybe I'll turn it over first to Professor Vino Thomas on the cost effectiveness or just the effectiveness uh, question. Um, uh, how would you answer Yi Yang uh, Wang? Okay, okay. Uh, actually, uh, fascinating questions on all counts. Um, uh, but starting with that, uh, surely uh, you would want to look at both the benefits and the costs uh, to make big decisions or judgments. And they may not all be quantifiable. They may not be quantifiable. Uh, necessarily quantifiable either, um, as, but uh, you need some notion of what is it worth to society, uh, including our precious planet. Um, and uh, so the valuation of that sometimes is so difficult. Uh, and so you know much more about how much investment does it need. So when Singapore says 100 billion, by 2100, it's some idea that that's the kind of cost that we can incur. Now, when things are difficult in terms of measuring both the benefits and costs, and when our conviction that the benefits are so huge, uh, there doesn't need to be such a careful analysis, like for instance, vaccinate everybody uh, uh, or uh, uh, have uh, clean water and so on, you could turn to what might be called the cost efficiency analysis without worrying uh, in quantitative terms on the benefits. Take them as God given. There are these huge benefits. How best can I do? There are three different ways of doing it. And I think the uh, speaker, the questions did touch on you know, electric grids or pricing. There are alternative ways and that is not insignificant. They can make a big difference. We decide, to cut, you know, reach carbon neutrality by 2060 or 2050. It's a done deal, that's a plan. I would argue do it quicker than later, but however it is decided on that count, you could then say, what is the cost efficient way, the best way to do uh, doing that? The uh, question also had a, 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 a variation on mitigation and adaptation, equally important. How much of that should go to mitigation? and how much to adaptation. Those would be cost efficiency uh, issues uh, that can be subjected to doable analysis, quantitative analysis, and the answers will make a big difference. My gut feeling would be that you would want a split between mitigation and adaptation, because if you did all adaptation with no mitigation, uh, it's going to be a never ending problem. You'll never be able to do enough adaptation to uh, address the growing greenhouse gases. If you only did mitigation, still problematic because uh, whatever we do today, uh, the, the needs of adapting to high sea level rises in Singapore is already there. It's too late uh, so in that sense. Uh, cost efficiency versus efficiency, um, it could be semantics in the sense that if you are measuring efficiency, I would include the cost very much, but not just the financial cost, economic and social costs as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I want to turn to Professor Leung Ching now and ask her, you know, um, the sub question was mitigation or adaptation. And you've done a lot of, lot of work on Singapore and that's the various challenges that it's facing domestically and globally. So what about, what is the purpose, do you think? Yeah, no, this is such a metaphysical question, right? So Yang, I mean, thank you for this question. What is the purpose? I mean, it's metaphysics. It, for me, it's the flourishing of human life, right? How do you best accomplish that? And once you think about that, so maybe I'll, I'll sort of say that so in a very pragmatic way, between mitigation and adaptation, I would kind of, strangely for an academic, right, give a straightforward answer and say adaptation. I'll, I'll say precisely why. In 2015, Singapore suffered from the longest drought ahead for 150 years. And of course, our mitigation um, uh, measures were, were fantastic. There was no drop in water supply. Uh, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, there was no drop even in the pressure of water right. supplied. So mitigating against these kinds of severe weather shocks, right. we were, you know, we were superb in the infrastructural resilience. However, the behavioral part of adapting it was terrible. 
So in the middle of a drought, surely you would know, like you would save water, or you would be more circumspect in, in using your watering, your you know various things. But turns out the water use went up by five percent. So adaptation in the behavioural and social sense, I think, at least for the case of Singapore, maybe in many small cities, I think it's something that would be uh, really important to work on. Uh, it's far more difficult than, in, in Singapore's case at least, um, than providing the infrastructure to mitigate these sorts of events. Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, really fascinating. And, and Professor Marina Kennedy, I want to ask you, we had this conversation before we began, uh, and it is also the case that sometimes a focus on climate comes at the expense of other issues like biodiversity loss. So for you, what's the purpose? Yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And I mean, obviously, there are so many different ways to answer it. Uh, but for me personally, the purpose is to bring in a holistic awareness of what we are dealing with. And if there is no holistic awareness, if we're only doing one aspect of things rather than understanding that there are loops, feedback loops in nature that, that are connected, we are only going to be addressing one part of the problem without realizing that there are so many other aspects to it. And also not realizing how nature perhaps can help us answer some questions, right? right? So right. to me, the purpose is always to find a holistic approach to what we are doing. Right. Because without the holistic approach, uh, we are, we are always going to miss uh, what's happening. And I want to disagree right. with Ching. If we're, are we allowed You're to disagree? To, yeah. Okay. So the reason why I want to disagree with you is because today I was listening to uh, the former prime minister of Tuvalu. Tuvalu is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, islands that are sinking each day, probably. And he said, literally, adaptation is not a solution because you can adapt to something that doesn't exist. Right? They're going underwater, so they cannot really adapt anymore. Um, they, need to, they need to find other ways. Right? So this is also where I want to bring in this holistic understanding of what we're dealing with, right? If we're only focusing on one part of the problem, we're missing so many other aspects of it. And I think that, that point also brings up the policy agenda. What issue is getting the policy agenda? And certainly when your country is sinking to the point of uh, no longer being able to be viable, that will be at the top. Right? Yeah. No, I didn't say it was only for Singapore. Right. Again, yeah. no, no, no hubris here, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. not. I didn't mean for for any any place else. Just right. here, right? Adaptation really requires some behavioral change. Yeah, and I want to say, uh, the chair here, um, we've got a really a number of really important questions to still get through that are really fantastic, uh, but I do want to respond to this question too. Um, and it's a bit dangerous, uh, I want to say to Yi Yang Wang, because, because I've written a paper on this very question. And of course, when an academic's written a paper on this question, and you, oh, you've only yeah, got a few we, seconds to we'll talk. We'll be here till eight. We'll be here till eight. Exactly. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat the paper. I'm just going to give you two examples, though, um, and say, I don't believe it's an academic's uh, responsibility to tell governments what policies they must address. Mm -hmm. That's a question for society and policy makers to deliberate over. But it is our job to give information about those problems so that a, they, the most comprehensive choice can be made. Okay, so in that context, there are two ways to think about sustainability in my area. I work a lot on forests and how mm -hmm. forests are actually managed for the environment and sustainability. One way is to sustain the growth of trees so that you don't over log these trees and have no forest. It's called sustained yield management. And it's a really important part of the environmental sustainability question around people having a long term benefit from forests and the forest is maintained. And Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in economics for working on this question. Okay. However, the other part of the story is forest ecosystem sustainability. And it turns out that 
um, the science in many cases tells us that the more you focus on timber sustainability, the more you degrade the ecosystem and you can actually render extinct species by doing so. And so, if you're a government that wants to work on endangered species, it probably is not the best place to start at timber sustainability as the purpose, but rather ecosystem sustainability as the purpose. So I can't tell you which one to choose, but I can tell you based on our research, if you want to address the species extinctions crisis, which one is the best one to think about in terms of fit for purpose, okay? And so anyway, really important question that's I think as you've, you've shown, uh, has revealed some provocative and important answers even among our, of our, our faculty here. Um, so I'm now gonna turn to um, um, a question from Chito uh, Trilanis, who asks the question, um, uh, and, I, and I'm aware we have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna ask for some relatively short answers from our panelists so we can get to a few more questions as well. Uh, uh, asks, is it possible that solidarity between environmental sustainability and economic progress uh, can actually happen? So it's a big question, um, but it does get, I think, at the, um, the er early point that uh, Professor Vino Thomas made. So I'm actually going to direct this question to him, uh, and then I'll ask other questions of the other faculty. So Professor Thomas, how do you answer that question? Is it really the case that you can do both at the same time? Uh, thank you. I know time is running out, but uh, I hope I'm not abusing this uh, op op opportunity to come in. Just two words on the mitigation adaptation question, because that dominates discussions uh, in Asia among policy leaders. And one way to think about it would could be uh, if the problem is entirely God given, uh, it's beyond control, it's exogenous factors then what else can you do except adapt, right? Um, uh, natural disasters were thought of at one point as totally driven by uh, external factors. It's mother nature. And so you do your best to build the dikes and uh, uh, sea walls and so on. But if the problem is human made, how could you solve it without going to the root of the problem and addressing that problem as well? and adapting so that the mix of the policies would become critical and in the case of climate change uh, increasingly i mean scientific uh, scientists are unanimous that it is um, uh, anthropogenic uh, and so uh, you need to do adaptation but you have to do mitigation as well uh, and that applies to big and small countries i would say but i think there could be variation but very quickly on the um, sustainability and growth. Um, yes, I mean, uh, eventually uh, there always is some kind of a landing uh, when we have crisis at hand. The question is, is it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing? Meaning um, it will become impossible not to do some actions on cutting carbon and greenhouse gas emissions down the road. But by then disasters would have struck so badly that it would be a very hard landing. So the two will be compatible by necessity at some point. The bigger question then would be, would we act in time to do both? And as I was implying that there really has been a thinking borne out by Asian experience that you can pollute your way to growth uh, for a long time and clean up later, uh, it still would have been much better if it was done together. It's just that the economic incentives we talked about short and long term are just so tilted in favor of the short that policymakers driven sometimes by uh, public awareness as well, um, take, take the easy way out. And so this whole discussion have been, how do we make the tough ch choices to align the short and the long and <clears throat> do those uh, steps on climate and the environment that are really uh, positive for medium and long-term growth, if not the short uh, as well. And I would say, yes, uh, it is possible, uh, but we also don't have a way out of this dilemma anymore. 
thank you very much. And I, I just want to take the chair's um, uh, prerogative and say that we have about six minutes left um, for our uh, conversation. And we did say we would go back to the faculty for two minute reflections on what we've talked about. Um, and so um, we actually only have time now for a minute and a half per faculty. I want to say for those who we didn't get your, to your questions, we thank you for your questions. We'll respond to them individually. We appreciate the engagement that you're, all, you're showing in the audience about these important uh, questions. So let's go backwards and we'll begin with Professor uh, Marina Canetti to give um, a minute and a half thoughts on what we've talked about today and what you think about uh, going forward. Yeah. Um very interesting conversation and I think the one thing that we didn't talk uh, enough about is um, something from the super wicked problems which is looking into the future right. and I want to again link it to the young generation the people that um, are becoming extremely um, engaged uh, everywhere around the world, including here in ASEAN. I think tomorrow is uh, Environmental Youth Day in this region for, um, uh, so, so there is definitely space for, for young people to be engaged. Um, and, and I think that's very important going forward to incorporate young people into how we how we think about and how we work on, on climate issues. And the last thing that I want to say is, um, I think working on climate will require, in the words of Christiana Fugueres, who is the Executive Secretary of the UNFCC, Triple C, uh, it requires stubborn optimism. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And now I'm aware of the time as the, as the chair here, so now Professor Vino Thomas for uh, uh, just a minute, a minute, if you could, a minute and a few seconds. Okay, um, just to underscore in closing, a fascinating discussion um, that the timing uh, that we focus on the short ones versus the long uh, uh, turns out to be uh, a, a deal breaker. And um, the economic profession and the business schools uh, may have not done the uh, part that would have been ideal for this in terms of uh, looking at the triple bottom line over the longer term, that could have given the motivation. And we need to change that so that the motivation is indeed uh, given for looking at a little bit beyond the next year. Um, and um, I would simply say that, uh, taking a cue from Marina, what did we not uh, stress enough? I think on country actions, take the China example, for instance, it's not enough to look at what is done for um, mitigation or adaptation within the borders, but what is being done regionally and globally. And so the net effect of imports and exports as well on their carbon and greenhouse gas content becomes important. So even as you're taking actions on the local front, if you're importing and exporting heavily carbon intensive goods and services, that needs to be changed as well. And on that count, India, China, UK, US, none of them does well, and that could be a big deal breaker uh, in this discussion. Um, and finally, happy. just a, a word. In all of this, I think the point about looking at uh, analytical frameworks and so on, you may be at, we may be at a point where some would argue that things are far too late for fine tuning. Uh, I would still say that at this point, uh, cost benefit analysis, economic analysis, social analysis, behavioral analysis, they really shed light both in understanding the issue, but also changing hearts and minds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Lian Ching. Um, just one sentence to say there is great hope. And the great hope is that governments are responding to people. This cuts across all political spectrums. And so the people ourselves, therefore, um, must provide this pressure to governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to just uh, take a few moments to uh, make a couple of observations as well. Uh, the first is going back to Professor Liang, Lian Ching's research that she mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation that in fact people do have values and norms uh, that um, sit alongside their own um, 
particular material interests, their, their interests in their own economic incentives. So one of the questions is, how do we think about then this problem where we tend to revert back to the short term and our self-interests versus the long term and our collective interests around these environmental uh, challenges facing the planet in a way that also addresses livelihoods and poverty and so on. And the answer I think you're hearing from the faculty members both in this panel but also from the faculty in the school generally is that the institutional context, the policy designs that we can come up with can actually address this super wicked feature of putting off the future. We can find ways to lock in our long-term collective interests around the values that bind us as citizens uh, in Singapore, as countries in ASEAN, and as citizens and countries in the world, uh, in which we all care about the effects we're having on ecological catastrophes and the important way of developing sustainability to bring along all, all peoples in meaningful and important ways. So with that, I want to thank all the faculty for a wonderful engagement. You at home, thank you so much for your questions. It was very exciting to be part of this, and we look forward to engaging more conversations with you uh, about the environment and uh, problems generally. Thank you. Thank you.